Peter. Zurich. Well, happy Easter. It's good to see y'all look good. Did you get your picture taken in the lobby already? If you haven't, do that on the way out. This is the day that we celebrate empty. Not a lot of people celebrate empty, but empty can be good when it's the empty tomb. So here's what I'd love to chat about today. What's the purpose of Easter? I mean, what's the purpose of having this empty tomb that we get together and celebrate and uh, whether you celebrate it once a year or all year long, we're glad that you're here. We're going to talk about the purpose of empty. The empty tomb means this. It means that we're offered this thing called life. But I want to be really honest about this this morning. Uh, because of this, uh, recent research reveals that people today, they're finding it more and more difficult to actually believe the Easter story. And it's not what you think. Uh, people are skeptical of the validity of the Easter story. Not that the tomb was empty and that someone came back to life. What they're questioning is that a 30-year-old man could actually have 12 friends. <laughs> Men, we get this, right? The, the women will laugh in a couple minutes and explain it to them. Uh, now, there are, there's other people who deeply believe in the Easter story. And they're like, yeah, the, the tomb was empty. There was a man who, who rose from the dead. We totally believe it. For example, there was a man and his wife and his mother-in-law who went on a trip to the Holy Land, but while they were there, she passed away. And the undertaker told him, listen, you can have her body prepared and shipped back home for $5,000, or you can bury her here in the Holy Land. And he thought about it for quite a while, and he thought, well, let's do this. Let's prepare her body, and we'll have the body shipped home. And the undertaker was confused. Like, why? I mean, why would you spend $5,000 to have her body shipped home when you could spend $150 and have her buried here in this beautiful place in the Holy Land? And the man said, listen, 2,000 years ago, a man died here. He was buried here, and he rose from the dead, came back to life. He said, I just can't take that chance. <laughs> whether you're skeptical of the resurrected Jesus and the tomb was empty or whether you fully believe it like this person that yes, no doubt, maybe you're 100% bought in that the tomb 2,000 years ago was empty and it carries the significance of life. Maybe you're still a little skeptical in checking it out. Maybe you actually believe it, but you don't really know why it matters. Like, why does it matter that the tomb was empty? No matter what you believe, I think you're going to find this helpful today as we talk about the purpose of Easter. Here, here's the purpose. We're going to find our answer from this man. Uh, his name is John. He was there from the very beginning. He was the youngest of all of Jesus's crew. He watched Jesus's life. He listened to all of his teachings. He witnessed Jesus die on the cross. He saw it firsthand. He went to the tomb, and he found that tomb empty. And then not just empty, but he also experienced the resurrected Jesus alive. And years later, he wrote a letter about the purpose of Easter. And we have it today in the historical documents known as the Gospel of John. So if you want to open your Bibles, you're totally welcome to open to John chapter 20. If you want to just follow along on the screen, you can do that today too. There's some notes that we gave you. There's some fill in the blanks. If you want to grab a pen and fill in the blank on this, you totally can too. It's something that you can take home to maybe mull this over. At the end of his letter, we're in the second to last chapter, and he writes these words. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of Easter. That's the purpose. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boil it down. I'm going to simplify it into this. Signs lead to believing. Believing leads to life. Signs 
lead to us believing. And when we believe, that actually leads to life. And John just didn't just like throw that in at the end of his message. Here's what he does. He, give us, he gives us seven signs throughout his whole book. Let, let me give them to you. And when I say signs, I mean this, miracles. Things that only God could do. That no matter If someone watched it, they'd be like, there's no way he pulled that off. God had to be a part of that. It was God's power. Now these seven miracles, these are signs so that people would do what? Believe in who Jesus was. But question, believing what about Jesus? Well, believing that he was more than just a teacher, more than just somebody who was claiming some magnificent things about himself, more than a prophet, but that he was actually the son of God who was offering people the gift of life. See, signs lead to believing, and believing leads to life. It's okay to talk in church sometimes, all right? So I want to show you these signs. You ready? So which signs did Jesus give? The seven signs found in the book of John, um, even before he gives us what he calls the first sign, he actually gives us the prequel. It's a sign before the seven signs. And he calls this guy named Philip, and he invites Philip to follow him. And Philip is so struck by this, he goes to his brother Nathaniel. He finds his brother sitting under a tree. And he says, you won't believe this. Let me just quote this to you. Um, Nathaniel tells him, uh, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, Jesus of Nazareth. And his brother Nathaniel responds, Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? But when Nathaniel meets Jesus, John writes this about it. So Nathaniel joins Philip and they, they go and meet Jesus. And, and Jesus says this, he says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. What he's saying is, I wasn't there. I wasn't like peeking over a hill and saw him calling. He's just saying, when your brother came and got you, I saw the tree that you were sitting under. I saw you there. What's his response? Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. I mean, this is the opening chapters in the book of John. He's like, I'm not hiding what it is I'm trying to prove to you. I'm trying to prove to you that Jesus isn't just a man, not just a teacher, not just a prophet, but he's the actual son of God. And then John goes into this. Let me give you the seven signs. Jesus goes to a wedding and they run out of wine. And the first sign, Jesus turns water into wine. And then at the end of it, John writes this. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And what happened as a result of that? Here it is. And his disciples believed in him. The sign led to believing. Next chapter goes on and Jesus heals this government official's son. He's near death. And then he kind of he mocks people. I mean, Jesus says this to him. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. But at the end of this, he heals this, this man's son and it says this, so this man and his whole household believed. And then John writes, this was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. A little bit later, John, uh, Jesus is walking by this pool and there's a paralyzed guy there. And he tells him, hey, you, you want to get well? The guy's like, well, of course. So he heals him. His legs gain strength. He gets up and walks. Third sign. Then he gets to this fourth sign. There's 5,000 people who are listening to Jesus. They didn't necessarily just come for his teaching. They started checking him out because, well, he was doing these miracles, these signs. He feeds 5,000 of them with just a basket full of food. You know this miracle? He starts breaking the bread and it just kind of never goes away and he just keeps serving it and serving it. And like, it's just endless food from just this little bit. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, this is what John writes, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. So they're like, they kind of got it right. They're kind of missing, like he's not just a prophet. But they're like, hey, tell me more. I, I, I wanna know, we know he's from God. Someone, a prophet is someone who was sent from God. So at that point, Jesus sends his, his crew across the lake. He's like, hey, listen, I need a little me time. I'm gonna spend some time with God. I'm gonna stay here, get in the boat, go across. And in the middle of the night, Jesus wants to join them. He don't have a boat. Not a problem for Jesus. He starts walking across the water and they see him partway across and they have this big moment where they're like, Jesus, I can't believe that's you. Once they're on the other side, at the end of the day, Peter makes this statement. He says, Lord, to whom else should we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you're the Holy One of God. You see, signs lead to believing, and believing leads to life, but we'll get there in a minute. Number six, his sixth sign, um, he actually heals this man who was born blind. Think about it for a minute. The man had never seen anything. He was born blind. After Jesus heals him and gives him physical sight, he gives him spiritual sight. He says this to the man, do you believe in the son of man? And that's how Jesus would refer to himself. He called himself the son of man. It's a spiritual reference to being the son of God. He says, do you believe in the son of man? And then Jesus says, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. And what's the man's response? He says this, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Do you get how amazing that, that sixth sign is? He gives him physical sight, and then he gives him spiritual sight by telling him, listen, I'm the guy you've been waiting for. I'm the son of God. And the man believes and he worships him. Now, when someone gets worshiped, you don't worship things or people. You only worship God. It's a reference to him being God. And then you get the seventh sign, last one. And it's maybe one of the most powerful. They have, Jesus has these friends, Mary and Martha, and their brother dies. His name is Lazarus. And Jesus shows up four days after Lazarus has died. He's put in a tomb. The tomb is sealed. And then he says, move the stone. He says, Lazarus, come out. Dead Lazarus is brought back to life. See, the resurrection of Jesus, it wasn't the only resurrection 2,000 years ago. And Lazarus comes walking out. He's wrapped in grave clothes. And Jesus is like, unwrap him, people, come on. This is the result. When you see a sign, people believe. This is what John writes. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Signs lead to believing, and believing leads to life. You got it. So question, did it work? I mean, he writes about these seven signs with the prequel sign, right? So did it work? Did people actually come to know who Jesus was? So at the end of that, John 12, this is where it transitioned. It says this about those who were coming. Many people, because they heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. They're like, listen, listen, if he's doing these signs, it proves something. So they start listening to the teachings and the stories of Jesus. And in the midst of that, Jesus starts predicting that he's going to die and come back to life. But it's interesting, no matter how many signs Jesus has given, there's a second group of people. And, and John writes about it. And he, he, this is what he writes. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. I mean, these people still exist today, to be honest. I, I don't know if you're one of them. I'm not trying to mock it. I'm just saying this simply. How many signs does God have to give us that Jesus is his son? How many signs does he have to give us that that, that tomb was empty that day for us to finally say, there's something about Jesus that's different than any person in the history of the world? because no other person in the history of the world has ever claimed that he's gonna die for the sins of the world and three days later come back to life. How many signs does he have to give us before we believe? And just in case that wasn't enough, Jesus, well, he's got one more final sign, and it's this. It's his own personal resurrection. Three times in the book of Mark, he says, I'm gonna die, and I'm gonna come back to life, be raised again after three days. I want to help us grapple with what happens when a person dies and the amazingness of actually seeing that person come alive again. Uh, the Mercury News on Friday, just this last week, ran an article in the opinion section. And when I read this, you'll know why it was in the opinion section. Uh, it was written by Dr. Tyler Johnson, a professor at Stanford School of Medicine. He's also an inpatient oncology service director at Stanford Hospital. He's a cancer doctor, okay? He wrote this opinion piece because he sees death a lot. And he remarks that almost all people in our culture, what do we do? We avoid death. We pretend it doesn't happen. We just keep as far from it as we possibly can. We don't want to be near our own death. 
We don't want to be near anybody else who's dying. This is what he writes. To give Easter its full due, we must first confront the reality of death. This recognition challenges us because we have successfully hidden dying, because death remains culturally invisible, and because we so intuitively recognize life's reality, it often feels as though death hardly exists at all. We may vaguely sense its reality hovering on the periphery of our perception, but soon dismiss such thoughts as unproductive, fatalistic, and frightening. Sometimes, when I work in the hospital, I am called to pronounce a death. That is, I must certify that a patient has expired. And then he writes this, this is what I find. Within seconds, what was previously a person transforms into a body, nothing more. Death halts the breathing, stills the heart, extinguishes the spark, and robs the face of laughter, anguish, joy, or sorrow. Molecularly, as soon as the heart stops, the body's cell become deprived of oxygen, and without that nourishment, cellular breakdown quickly ensues. At the bedside, I see lying before me a lifeless, motionless corpse, a collection of cartilage, bone, nerve, and sinew with no other purpose, no coordination or movement, no beauty, no control. He says, this is concrete. The concrete reality we all face. And we must learn this fact, that this happened to Jesus too. After Jesus announced, it is finished on the cross, his body was just that. It was a body and it began to decay. And he was wrapped in burial linens out of respect, but also for the practical purpose of keeping together a lifeless, moldering body that would soon come apart, especially with multiple undressed wounds that would soon begin to fester. It was this lifeless thing that would have been placed in Joseph's tomb. Are you getting the insights from a doctor who knows death firsthand? He finishes with this. We must make ourselves pause the reel at that very moment, staring in horror at the scene. For those few faithful disciples who had really begun to believe Jesus meant what he taught, the act of laying his lifeless body in the tomb must have stung with hopeless finality. And then he pauses in his article and he says this, in the last several years, death has taken center stage for us through COVID, the war in Ukraine, other atrocities around the world. But then he states this, we can only find comfort in Easter if we first recognize the despair that must have suffocated Jesus' followers at his death. Only with a full appreciation of this reality can we imagine what that third morning must have been like. Only then can we begin to recognize what those first unbelievable whispers of hope must have meant. The way their hearts must have raced, how their minds must have wrestled with the preposterous. What do you mean alive again? The stunned recognition when Mary knew the one she was looking at wasn't the gardener. The beauty of the inner quickening that hurried John and Peter to run to the tomb. And the tears of joy, I imagine, streamed in rivulets down Mary's cheeks as confronted with the unimaginable, a real, a whole, a regal Jesus standing healed and aglow in holy splendor, not dead, not moldering, not coming apart, but alive again. Most of us don't have much experience with death, but we need to. I love his perspective because he has firsthand experience and his words were a reminder of how powerful the sign was that Jesus gave us because signs lead to believing and believing leads to life. Now, oddly enough, I've already given you the prequel to the signs, the seven signs, an additional sign on top of the seven of Jesus' own resurrection and John's not even done yet because you remember like the disciples, they're all huddled in a room and like Jesus shows up. The problem is this, Thomas didn't get the memo. He wasn't there. And like, Thomas, you missed it. Jesus was here. And he makes that famous statement, right? Because we know Thomas as doubting Thomas. Y'all read the story, right? And he makes this, um, 
he makes this interesting statement. He says, listen, I'm not going to believe unless I see a sign. I want to be able to put my fingers in the nail marks in his hands. I want to put my hand in the spear mark in his side. And seven days roll by. And they're all together in the room, but this time Thomas is there and Jesus shows up and he's like, hey, Tom, go ahead. Put your fingers right here in my hands. Now, it never says that Thomas does anything at that point as far as putting, I don't know if he looked at him, he's like, that's disgusting. I'm not putting my fingers in there. But we do get this response. He verbalizes this. He says, my Lord and my God. Because signs lead to believing, and believing leads to life. That's the purpose of Easter. It's the purpose of John's entire gospel story. He's trying to convince you of all of the signs that Jesus really wasn't just a person who made these outrageous claims and then died. That that tomb being empty was a sign, along with all the other signs, that if you believe in Jesus that there's life in his name. Here's what's interesting. Right after that story of Thomas, John makes this statement, and I've already read it to you. It's the purpose of his letter and the purpose of Easter. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So those are the signs. He claims there's seven, and he gives you like 10. So question, what does it mean to believe? Let me just run through this real quick. It's the ABCs of believing. A, B, C. What are they? The first is this, accept. If you're going to believe, you have to accept the truth about who Jesus is. Who is he? Well, if he claimed to be the son of God, then we have to accept that based on the signs. He's completely human. He experienced real death. That wasn't like fake God on the cross. He wasn't pretending to be human. He was, but he was also God because no one could have performed those signs unless they were God. He was also crucified for our sins. He paid for our sins on the cross and he was resurrected. That tomb was empty and he's alive today. But we have to accept the truth about who he is. We don't get to make up our own truth. The people who saw it and experienced, they wrote about it and said, I'm giving this to you so that you can believe, because the signs lead to, stay with me, people. (laughs) The signs lead to believing. Believing leads to, so the first ABC is, it's accept the truth about who Jesus is. The B is believe in why he came. This is not just about the facts. And if you think, you know what, okay, I can believe that. No, 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 no. It's not just accepting the facts. We have to believe that it's actually personal to us, that he actually loves you and he died on the cross for you and he offers you new life. It's accepting the truth and then believing why he came. And here's the C. And this is an important part because some of us just think it's the AB of believing. (laughs) Like, oh yeah, I can accept that and I can believe that. If you miss that C, you've missed it. You've missed life because you're not, it doesn't mean believing. The C is this. It's actually commit to a relationship with Jesus. It's committing yourself to having a relationship with the living Jesus. You know, when you become a Christian, it's not about having a relationship with the Bible. This is a tool to to an end. It's a tool that we learn this and we read this to discover who he is. And it's actually... It's such an amazing tool that God promises this. When you read this, I will speak to you from this. This relationship we're committing to is a relationship with the living Jesus. That's why we pray. We're not just saying words and like reciting messages. We're actually talking to the living God. ABCs, right? Accept, believe, and commit. So here's my final question. We've talked about the signs. We've talked about believing, Let's talk about life real quick before we wrap this up. Um, What kind of life was Jesus offering? Here's what's interesting. 17 times in the book of John, he uses the word signs. And then 17 times, he uses the words eternal life. What kind of life was Jesus offering? It's eternal life. It's what it is. Let me read to you a few things that that John wrote about this. John 5, 24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged, 
but crosses over from death to life. It's a life after this life that will last forever, but it's where we spend time with God as opposed to apart from God. That's eternal life. Now, the, the night before his death, Jesus is with his followers and he tells them, I'm going away. But he also makes this unbelievable promise. He says this, my father's house, it's a reference to heaven. My father's house has many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Like he, he's telling them, this, this is what eternal life is. I'm gonna prepare a place for you in heaven. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And then he makes this crazy statement. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father. No one gets to the place where I'm preparing unless you come through me. He promised eternal life. And just in case we missed it, he's like, listen, I wrote a whole letter called the Gospel of John. And if that didn't convince you enough, he writes three more letters. First John, second John, third John. At the end of first John, he's like, listen, if you haven't got it by now, let me just clarify, make one final statement to you. He writes this, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Listen to this part. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you? I mean, do you have this eternal life? Do you know what happens after this life? And do you know that you will be with God? But what is that based on? See, signs lead to believing, and believing leads to life. If you hope you're just going to get there and like sneak into heaven, like what is that based off of? What signs do you have that your belief about God is actually true? We have all kinds of these signs that it's only through Jesus. But here's what's interesting. It's not just about what we get at the end. It's actually what we get today. Don't miss this. I think the second kind of life that Jesus offers us is the Jesus-led life. He wants to be with you today. He wants to lead your life today. In the middle of John's gospel, uh, Jesus makes this statement. He said, I, I've come that you might have life and you might have it to the full. What does that mean? It means like we're never gonna get hurt. Life's always gonna be fun. We're always gonna be rich. Like, no, 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 no. He says, I want you to have life to the full. And then he gives us this analogy. He's like, listen, I'm the good shepherd. And my sheep, they're my people. My sheep know my voice. They hear me. They follow me. They come to me. And he says, uh, he also says that no one can snatch them out of my father's hand because like, I'm your shepherd. He gives this great analogy to what I would call the Jesus-led life. That if you're a Christian, maybe you thought that by a prayer you prayed, you got into heaven and it's all at the end, and it's not. It's right here, and it's right now, that when you say, yeah, I believe the ABCs, accept the truth about Jesus, believe in why he came, and commit your life to follow him, you're actually saying right here, right now, I have a relationship with God, where he forgives you of all the things that we've done that dishonor him, that go against his holiness, and we can actually be adopted into his family, that's what he's trying to say. This analogy with a shepherd and sheep is about his, him being present with us. And just in case we missed it, he says, now this is eternal life, that they will know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That word know, it's not intellectual. It's this experiential, you know what it looks like to walk with God, to be a friend of Jesus every day. The signs in the book of John are so that we would believe who Jesus claimed to be, the Son of God who dies on the cross for our forgiveness. That's who he is. Question, do you believe? Do you believe that God has given us enough signs and evidence? And have you crossed that line of faith to say, yeah, I not just want eternal life, but I actually want that, that Jesus-led life. Can I wrap up just with this? I'm going to close. But um, I know there's some of you, you came today, and I'm super glad you are all here. You're always welcome here. But if I could be really honest, I know there's some of you who are kind of skeptical. That Easter's a good time to show up, um, get to wear a nice outfit, or maybe have to wear a nice outfit. 
You don't always. I'm just saying, show up how you are. But then we'll see you at Christmas, right? <laughs> and I, I don't say that to be offensive. I'm just saying that to let's just be honest for a second. Like, you're skeptical because you're not sure about the signs and if it's really true. And what does it mean to really believe? And if that's true, I don't really know what this life means, the, the eternal life or the Jesus-led life. Can I invite you to do something, though? And, and maybe some of you, you're here today, and you have skeptical people in your life, and they're skeptical, and they're like, I ain't going to church this Easter, all right? But if you have skeptical people, can I invite you to do something? Get together with people, someone that you trust, and just read the Gospel of John. You'll find it. There's a table of contents. Look it up. Gospel of John. Just read through it and just ask these three questions. Um, signs. Do the miracles, do the signs in the book actually validate the claims that Jesus made about himself? And the second is this. What is Jesus inviting you to believe about himself? Look at the signs. Look at what he's talking about believing. And then this, what does Jesus mean by life? Check it out for yourself. Don't trust my words on it. But then this is probably the most important question. Do you have this life? This life of eternity when you die, that you are with God. Because whatever you have right now on earth, that's what you're going to get in eternity. And if you want a life without God right now, that exists in eternity. But none of us really want it. If we want to have the with God life, the Jesus-led life today, that's what we get in eternity. And I hope you will have that. So, I would say this. If you're skeptical, go through that. And check it out for yourself because there's enough signs because signs lead to believing and believing leads to, that's the purpose of Easter. And that's the purpose of John's gospel. Um, as I wrap this up, do you have eternal life? Do you have the Jesus-led life today? And I know, it's so weird because I know that some of you, you might've just been waiting for somebody to invite you to this to ask you, hey, do you want it? And so I'm going to ask you right now, do you want this life? Do you want this life? Because if you want it, we're going to walk through the believing process right now. And I'm going to pray. I'm just going to ask you, the ABCs, will you accept the truth about Jesus? Do you believe in why he came? And are you going to commit your life to walk with him? And that's it. So I want you to do this. Bow your heads right now. Let's close our eyes. We really just close our eyes. It's nothing mystical about it. It's just simply this. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes so that really you're not distracted by the people around you. If you are not a Christian and this now makes sense to you and you're ready to believe, I'm gonna invite you to just pray with me in a minute. But I know there's another group in the room that you call yourself a Christian, but you know you have not been living a Jesus-led life. You're just kind of hoping for heaven in the end. I want to invite you to pray this and do life differently and step full force into this Jesus-led life. So for both groups, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray right now. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If you want this, just pray this with me. You can use my words, say something similar to it. It's just got to come from the heart, though. Pray with me. Jesus, I accept the truth that you are God's son, that you died for my sins. I accept that. I accept the fact that you rose from the grave and that you're alive today. That's the accept part. Let's pray this together. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. And I ask you today, would you forgive me? And would you give me this new life that you offer? God, I want eternal life. I want to be with you forever. And God, I want this Jesus-led life. I want to walk in a brand new way. And let's commit. God, I commit to living in this relationship with you. I might not even have a clue as to how to do this, but God, I'm going to trust that you're going to show me. But I commit to walk in your ways. With eyes closed and heads bowed, here's what I want you to do right now. I'm going to ask you, to raise your hand. I will not call you out. I will not embarrass you. I just want you to know that you prayed that prayer today. So close your eyes, heads bowed. Raise your hand if you just prayed that prayer. Thank you. There's hands all over the place. I got you. Good. Good. Keep them up. I see you. I'm looking in the balcony right now. God, I want to pray for these folks. 
Thank you for raising your hands. Thank you for making that decision today. Lord, I just, I want to pray for these folks right now. Would you, uh, first of all, I thank you for their decision, God. We believe that you've given these people new life today. And I just pray that they would have a, a sense that their old guilt is released and gone, that you've given them a new future. God, we trust that you're going to help them from this day on to know you and follow you. And we thank you for how you change people's lives. And everybody said, amen. Hey, would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing the last song, but listen, if you made that decision, don't let that be anonymous. There's a card in front of you. Fill that out. Let us know and tell the people that you came with today. But we want to celebrate. Church, how do we feel when people find new life? Amen? All right, let's sing.